The Phantom Friar by Augustine J. H. Dugan You admire our little church, sir, said the sacristan to me as we rested together upon a stone horse block, worn smooth by the feet of many a squire and yeoman, now reposing quietly in the green churchyard, skirted by the low wall which supported our backs indeed it is one of the most interesting of all the rural churches which i have seen in england you come from abroad sir i am an american i replied indeed and i fancied the old sacristan regarded me with a still kindlier eye perhaps some favourite child had left the paternal roof and now dwelt upon new england's hills or among the south savannas but I did not question the venerable man. Who knows, indeed, what chord might have been awakened? Is there no legend connected with this church, my friend? Twere a pity, if not. That there is, sir, and if you can listen to an old man's tale, I can do no better than to while your time till we hear the steam whistle. Many thanks. You will not only while the time, but, I doubt not, entertain me greatly i own myself an inveterate legend hunter the sacristan smiled and at once commenced you must know sir that on the site of this church which is now about one hundred and fifty years old existed formerly a very prosperous abbey belonging to the monks of st benedict or blackfriars as they were commonly called it was reputed to contain great store of solid wealth and consequently when the wars broke out between cavalier and puritan was very speedily assaulted dismantled and nearly destroyed by one of cromwell's zealous captains who however got but his labour for his pains inasmuch as not a penny of lucre was found in possession of monk or abbot nevertheless the brotherhood that is, such as escaped the bloody shrift so common in those days, were effectually dispersed by the violence done to their dwelling-place, and since that period no black friar has ever told his beads in the neighbourhood. But it was not many years before superstition began to invest the ruins with the usual dread, attached to monuments of past violence, and to people with ghostly visitors the halls deserted by mortal footsteps meanwhile cromwell and his stern troopers gave place to charles and his reckless cavaliers and these in turn made way for james and his shaven monks about which time there began to be rumours of a contemplated rebuilding of the benedictine abbey which set all the gossips of suffolk to whispering about the apparition of an old friar who on several occasions as averred by the peasants had been seen flitting among the ivy-mantled stones or stooping over the broken slabs in the ancient burial-place but the work of restoration was never commenced though it was asserted that commissioners from the king had actually visited the place and as was said entered upon negotiations with artisans However, there was very good reason why the design of rebuilding the abbey, if such, indeed, had been entertained, should not be completed. For about this period the pious James was forced to pack up his royalty and decamp for the French court, whilst his dutiful daughter Mary and his son-in-law William of Nassau took quiet possession of his crown and kingdom. Nearly half a century had now passed since the sack and destruction of the abbey, and its supernatural reputation had grown apace with the weeds which tangled themselves into rank luxuriance among the old walls and fallen roof-trees. Periodically was seen to walk about the grounds the ghost of an aged monk attired in the black serge garment of the Benedictines, and more than one benighted traveller had heard, as he would swear roundly, 
the mumbling of mass by that black friar amid the ruins while satan himself in a cowl sat astride of a tombstone delivering the responses it is no wonder then that the dismantled monastery became at length known as the dell's abbey or that it was decided to be no fit walk for christian foot but to be left to witches for a nocturnal trysting place but about the second year of the dutch stadtholder's reign it chanced that a worthy peddler who was in the habit of vending ribbons and trinkets through the rural districts and by his uncommon honesty as a hawker and good humour as a companion enjoyed no small modicum of popularity among his rustic customers found himself one michaelmas eve in the unhappy vicinity of our haunted monastery he had taken a short cut across the fields in order to reach sooner the market town where he made his home and kept a little warehouse for the goods which he trafficked up and down the country and had just gained the wild spot on which stood the ruins when a violent thunderstorm arising suddenly obliged him for the salvation of his pack to seek speedy shelter under one of the still upright and ivy-covered arches he happily discovered a dry resting-place and quickly made himself as comfortable as circumstances would allow it was near dark when the storm arose and will nuttall as the peddler was named expected that it would soon spend its force and pass away leaving him to be sure the wet fields for his journey but with the returning moon to guide his path he miscalculated however the duration of the tempest which continued to rage with unabated fury till hours had passed away and he began to reckon midnight very near at hand now master nuttall was a stout-hearted and merry fellow little troubled by ghost stories though he was in the habit of relating to the wide-mouthed lads and round-eyed lasses who ever welcomed him to meet and lodging in their snug farmhouses nevertheless the reflection that he was alone at midnight in the very headquarters of hobgoblinry and on michaelmas eve too chosen as is well known of all nights in the year for witch revels and incantations did not it may be fancied decrease the unpleasantness of his situation in truth as the night wore on he grew somewhat more nervish than was his wont and long ere the storm gave signs of lull he had many times devoutly wished himself safely out of the dell's abbey at length the clouds parted the wind sank and large drops succeeded to the close showers which had followed fast on one another through the night till at last the moon broke out letting its radiance gush full over field and forest making the moist landscape glitter in silver sheen will nuttall stretched his legs rose briskly and slung his pack and then stepped from under the protecting arch to pursue his homeward journey essaying at the same time a lively whistle either to summon his courage or to scare away whatsoever lurking elves might be peering at him from the still sombre shadows of the ruins but whistle and foot were both abruptly checked as will's eye glanced toward the ancient burial ground and saw where plainly defined in the moonlight the figure of an old man clad in monkish habit was stooping near a grey tomb not twenty paces from the spot where he himself stood the peddler stared fixedly unable to withdraw his eyes though his frame shook in every joint while the phantom friar rose slowly from its bending posture and uplifting its hands in one of which was grasped a black crucifix stood a moment bolt upright as if invoking a curse upon the wretched mortal who had intruded on its domain will nuttall strove to run away but his feet refused to turn he tried to cry aloud but his voice failed him so doing the only thing he could 
he let his knees double under him and sank quietly on the wet grass where he lay prostrate for a space shivering like one in an ague fit expecting each moment to feel a bony hand on his head or a pair of skeleton legs bestriding his broad shoulders but as neither of these consequences followed he soon ventured to raise his head a bit and finally without looking toward the grey tombstone to bolt suddenly away into the broad moonlit highway a few rods off whence he made his way homeward with all the speed he could command next morning will nuttall was late in setting out with his pack and the neighbours noted that he was not in his usual spirits but the pedlar mentioned naught concerning his nocturnal adventure for indeed he began already to feel ashamed of his fright and to ask himself how a blithe ghost-jeering lad like will nuttall could have run away from some shadow of his own fancy so he kept his counsel and went on as usual plying his traffic from hamlet to hamlet getting little richer it is true for he was a free-hearted fellow but making store of friends in his up-and-down wanderings so a year passed away and michaelmas eve drew near again and as it chanced found will in the neighbourhood again of the haunted dell's abbey an errant dolt was i to run away from my own shadow quoth the pedlar to himself as he called to mind his midnight terror faith i ha e'en a mind to pass another michaelmas at the old friar's gate and see if mine host will bestir himself no sooner resolved than will nuttall set forth to execute and once more as the moonbeams streamed brightly over the ancient ruins with no storm to interrupt their beauty the bold pedlar appeared hard upon the witching hour and as if to dare the phantom to its worst advanced with a stout cudgel over the shoulder which bore his pack and took post beside the very grey tombstone over which he had beheld the ghost monk stooping but o oh, rash and foolhardy wight scarce had he reached the slab when turning toward the shattered arch where he had before found shelter he beheld the self-same sight that had then appalled him the figure of an aged monk with cowl and crucifix emerged from the ivied shadow and with slow steps approached as if to confront him will nuttall saw and his courage evaporated down he subsided as before and with what little strength he could muster crawled and burrowed until he had got himself quite underneath a broken stone hatchment that rested slantingly against the old grey tomb here shrinking into as small a bulk as possible as if he hoped by such means to elude the grim friar he held his breath and strove to bethink him of all the prayers which he had ever forgotten in another moment he felt a rustle of garments close beside him and presently a low voice muttered some strange words in a language unknown to him to which consequently he did not feel himself called upon to reply though he had his misgivings as to whether it might not be his own death sentence delivered by some demoniac judge to this low voice monotonous and rapid the hopeless pedlar listened for several minutes and then all became silent again meantime almost ready to give up his personal ghost most bitterly did he bewail his past scepticism regarding supernatural beings and firmly did he resolve if delivered safe out of the black friar's clutches to believe most devoutly henceforth in spooks spirits brownies and banshees of whatever degree clime or complexion thus fortified he ventured when the voice ceased to raise his head an inch and steal a look at his ghostly neighbour very phantom-like and grim indeed was the old face which looked out 
from under that black cowl and ashy were the cheeks and glassy the fixed eyes the figure knelt against the tomb close to the hatchment which concealed the peddler its thin hands clasped and pressed against its breast a sable crucifix its withered lips appeared still to move but emitted no sound will nuttall saw all this at a glance and the next moment beheld the phantom sink bodily downward and disappear under the churchyard sod well that to be sure was enough to frighten flesh and blood however bold its possessor so it was no marvel that will fainted incontinently away under his hatchment and thus he remained until the light of a rosy morning chased off all evil things and peered into his face and woke him once more to the world of living things he was drenched with the heavy night dew but beyond this had sustained no injury to his corporeal substance now am i an ass or there be ghosts soliloquized will nuttall as he gradually became aware of his identity and rubbed his eyes to get a better look of every object around him what i have seen now no christian man may speak lightly of i and ear were open if faith nevertheless if ghosts there be it be plain too they have no power or mortal man else were i not unharmed this day so if there harbour no malice nor hurt i the good people let no evil be spoken of them say i talking thus to himself and peering boldly about him as he saw the sunlight brightening in the east will shook himself and proceeded to impart animation to his benumbed limbs by a liberal bestowal of smart buffets on his breast the old grey tombs began by this time to look cheery in the morning beams and the ivied arches and shattered walls had lost all trace of ghostliness nevertheless our peddler could not help a fearsome qualm as his eyes fell upon the spot where they had beheld the black friar disappear under the sod but will nuttall's look dwelt longer than before for it had caught sudden sight of an opening just beneath the grey tomb and close beside the hatchment which had so opportunely covered his person the peddler stooped and beheld a square aperture half concealed by dank weeds below which were several steps of stone apparently leading to a vault beneath the monument into this aperture he peered curiously but all was dark only a smell of damp earth came from beneath will nuttall paused a few moments and then a strange fancy came into his mind if ghosts must have holes to go and come by quoth he they be little better off than people with bodies this reflection inspiring him he hesitated not to put his best foot through the square opening and descend cautiously the slippery stones very dimly lit was the sepulchral vault to which the bold hawker found his way but he could see that it was an oblong apartment and very much like other ancient receptacles of mortality but what drew his notice first was a little mound of earth near the foot of the stone steps which seemed to have been lately disturbed and a mattock and pick in a niche near by to which there yet clung several lumps of moist yellow clay ho oh, said will nuttall they be strange ghosts that use mattocks to dig their graves withal will nuttall sat himself down upon one of the stone steps with the morning light faintly entering over his shoulder to the old vault and began to reflect upon phantoms in general and black benedictines in particular the result of his cogitations was his sudden springing to his feet seizing the pick and digging away at the little mound with as hearty a will as if he had been a born sexton and not long indeed had he to labour ere his pick struck against a hard substance 
and a few shovels full of clay removed discovered to his wandering eyes a goodly sized oaken chest bound with iron bands one or two sturdy blows sufficed to split the mouldy lid and the poor peddler almost shrieked aloud as he beheld it filled with rusty silver coin will was a shrewd fellow and quickly determined on his course of action the treasure could not all be removed at once but it was not long before he had conveyed it by piecemeal to his little warehouse in the market town then he gave out that he should no longer pursue the hawker's trade but enlarging his shop soon branched out into cautious speculation until he got the reputation of a thriving tradesman worthy of all respect now nearly seven years after this it happened that the parish church was struck by lightning during a storm and so burned by the flames that it became necessary for a public appeal to be made for a general subscription to repair the edifice among others to whom the officers applied was will nuttall the good fellow looked over the list of those who had already contributed what's this said he the squire but five pounds the doctor but one pound the it is too true said one of the officers more might they afford but alas i fear our poor church will be slowly mended here i will do what i can said will nuttall and he straightway subscribed twenty pounds which so surprised the worthy deacon that had spoken that he rubbed his spectacles thrice as he looked at the figures then bidding thanks to the tradesman he was about to depart when his eye caught sight of the counter on which the subscription book had been lying and which was a very ancient piece of oak with strange old letters writ upon it but scarce to be noticed so nearly were they raised aha you have something odd here master nuttall said the old deacon who was a bit of an antiquary w what is it stammered will for he at once recollected that this counter slab was the lid of the old chest which had held his treasure and which he had placed in its present position as a memorial of his good fortune something i decipher but it is in old gothic text answered the worthy deacon will it please you to read it sir asked will i mean the english of it the antiquary rubbed his spectacles and stooping nearer read in the lands where this stood another stands twice as good hem said will nuttall what may that signify we are as wise now as before ay rejoined the deacon for who can tell where an old oak tree stood who indeed echoed will but when the antiquary and deacon had gone the good merchant said to himself ah ha ha perhaps i can tell where it stood and see if there be another twice as good i'll be off presently so indeed will nuttall lost no time in visiting the dell's abbey again taking good care to conceal his motions from everybody and sure enough some feet deeper than the spot where he had discovered the silver was buried another coffer not so large but far more valuable inasmuch as it was filled with golden crowns instead of silver this prize he made his own with all the caution that he had before observed and from that time henceforth he prospered after saying to himself there is a blessing goes with helping churches and this church said i to the sacristan was built by the peddler's secret treasure answered the old man will nuttall purchased all the land and here erected the structure you have admired ordering the ancient abbey model to be preserved look in yonder oriel window do you see what is painted on the stained glass i looked and saw the representation of a figure with a burden on his shoulder it is the peddler and his pack said the sacristan but the old monk 
the black friar the phantom i asked it was but we were interrupted for the shrill whistle of the mail train was heard and in another moment whiz london sir i was aboard and we were off in a second but as i looked back i saw the sacristan wave his hand and caught a glimpse of the peddler's church through the grove around and then i had left all forever end of the phantom friar by augustine dugan